Can anyone hear me? Hello, good evening. Good evening, can anyone hear me? Good, I see Cristal. Good evening, Cristal, it's good to see you. Let me give it a couple of minutes here and then we'll have prayer. I see Karen Malbeck, hello. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, Brian loves me and I love Brian. He's a good guy. I'm glad to have him in my life. And there's Pastor Zach. Hey, Pastor Zach, how you doing? All right, just a few more seconds here and we'll have a prayer and uh, get started. My cat wants to get in here, but if she was in here, you wouldn't hear me. All right, it's seven o'clock. Uh, let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, you know we're here for you. We want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, be able to live stream and be able to communicate during this pandemic, Lord. It's been a huge blessing to me, and I'm grateful for it. And I'm sure a lot of others are too, Lord. I'm not a speaker, but Lord, you know that my heart is, you know where my heart is. And I just pray that you would help the things that I say tonight to help some other people the way that I've been helped this week. I thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Let's start right now. I had swim anxiety. This is probably not a major problem for most people, but for the last six years, I've been competing in long course triathlon. All 10 races I've done have started with the swim, all but one at least 1.2 miles long or longer. The interesting thing about my swim anxiety is that it's always there to some degree or another. It's not affected by how much preparation I've done or how easy or hard the course might be. I've always worked hard. I've always arrived at race day prepared. I've never done less than all I could to be ready for the swim. However, I've worried about the swim leg of my triathlons until my feet were in the water every time. I've never had any serious issues once I got there. That fact never seems to help with the next race, however. This got me thinking about some, something else that I've always caused me much anxiety. I've always had a fear of end time events. It comes and it goes, but it's always there. I don't think I've ever honestly been able to say that I've longed for Jesus to return as most Christians do. This has always bothered me. I've prayed for years that God would help me change. God doesn't deserve my lack of faith in him. He has never let me down. I have no reason to doubt that he will do as he promised. The only thing he hasn't done is take away my fear. I've quoted Psalm 34, 4 countless times, expecting it to be delivered before my prayer was done. The text says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from my fears. I guess God has been trying to teach me the finer points of patience. For most of this pandemic, I've been doing all right. The first day Governor Evers talked of the stay at home order was pretty bad. I heard of it while at work, and in the mix of my co-workers is one who is a conspiracy theorist, who is rambling on and on about loading all his guns and freezers full of rations. Everyone was on edge. No one knew what to expect. The company owner called a meeting and explained that our health insurance was paid for and we wouldn't lose any coverage whether we were forced to close or not. We all thought that, that when the stay-at-home order went into effect, we would be done working, maybe for good. As it turned out, my job was considered essential. I went to work the following Monday. I've worked fairly steadily until last Thursday. 
During that time, I've had a few neat opportunities. I've asked God to bring people into my life that were more fearful than I was. One morning, I was talking to one of the guys I work with. He seemed quiet and reserved. This particular day, our jobs were in the same area. I asked him if he was okay. He said, I'm concerned because my stepdaughter is supposed to see her father this weekend. He lives up north. He is a cop and his girlfriend is a first responder. My wife and I told him that we didn't think it was in our daughter's best interest to be up there for the weekend. The town he lives in has asked that anyone who doesn't live there year-round stay away during the quarantine. In addition to this, if her dad and his girlfriend got a call to go to an emergency, our daughter would be left by herself during this crisis. I told him that I thought his views made sense. I said, he said, sense or not, the father has threatened legal action. I asked him if he would like to pray about it. His response was, it won't do any good. Normally I have left it at that. I'm not usually one to push past that point. While I wholeheartedly believe in the power of prayer, I don't think you can force someone else to. This time I responded differently. Without missing a beat, I said, I hear that you don't think it will help, but can it hurt? He looked at me with this little smile coming across his face and he said, I really hate it when you're right. We prayed about the situation and for the next few days, I asked him about it every time I saw him. Then one day I forgot. We had he had walked past and said that, he said that plans had changed. The dad had had his work schedule changed, and as a result, the whole thing was no longer an issue. I, of course, said, I told you God would take care of it. I hope that when he thinks about it, he can see the pattern that I do. Another day, I, was, I, was, I had an experience with my neighbor. I was in my backyard working on my car. My neighbor came over and started talking. I hadn't seen him in several months, so I asked him how he was. He proceeded to tell me that his twin brother, who he lives with, had surgery for lung cancer in January. He was expected to have a full recovery, but was concerned about the virus, as his brother was high risk because of the surgery. I told him that I would pray for him. Then I told him about an experience I had last fall and how God used me in a situation that I felt unqualified for. I told him that being used by God for this small task was one of the coolest things I'd ever experienced. This conversation might not seem like much, but I've lived next to this man for almost 20 years, and I don't think we've ever spoken about religion before that time. I had these and a couple of other small instances during the last three weeks. They seemed to help me stay somewhat at peace. Then God, then God dropped some knowledge on me. I went to work Thursday morning. I've been listening to most of the devotionals on the Greater Milwaukee Adventist Fellowship Facebook page while at work. Before I started, I scanned the feed for a speaker and topic of the day. I found that at 9 a.m. devotional, the, the 9 a.m. devotional was by Pastor Titus Naphtalinia, and the title was Freedom from Fear-Based Religion. I knew I had to listen to it. Once it started, it was like God was speaking directly to me. I'm kind of glad that no one came to my welding booth while I was listening to the talk. I was crying pretty good and probably looked like somebody ran over my dog. Everything Pastor Titus said could have been written about me, right down to being told of Christian martyrs' gruesome murders when he was young, and the effect it had on him. Then he mentioned, when he mentioned that, I remembered a meeting I went to in primary in the primary tent to camp meeting. I must have been around 12. All I remember about it was that we were told about someone who was hung and then disemboweled because they wouldn't recant their belief in Jesus. I remember walking back to the cabin thinking, I could never do that, and I was probably not going to stand firm in the end. I finished listening to the devotional, and my boss came over to the booth. I was glad I wasn't crying anymore. That was a plus. He said to come over to the break area. We were having a meeting in a few minutes. When the meeting started, he said that we would be cutting hours down to three days a week. In the previous meeting, he was pretty clear about what the slackers in our crew could expect. There are a few of them, and they do the bare minimum to get by, and are more concerned with hanging out than working. 
and are sometimes disruptive to those of us who are serious about our jobs. He had said that, that they would probably be laid off and couldn't and shouldn't expect to return. Times were hard, and when this was over, they were going to be good people in need of work, and he would have the opportunity to hire those types of people. After he told us about the hour reduction, he mentioned that he was going to have one welder and one all-around guy on staff Monday and each Friday, in addition to the three days, and he would rotate the roster so that it was fair, trying to keep everyone working as long as possible. He told us that the company was in excellent shape to get through the crisis, and that if anyone was in danger of losing their home or anything, that they should come and talk to him, and he would see if he could help. He could have gone a few different ways to conserve money. He could have just shut his business down, or he could have done like we all thought he would after the first meeting. He could have picked the best people so they could be as efficient as possible and minimize his losses. Instead, he chose to show grace to the very people who on paper hadn't earned it. Between the wonderful devotional and his awesome follow-up, I had much to contemplate. I thought all day about it, and for the first time I started to question why I was afraid. The answer isn't what I would have expected. Somewhere in all this, I realized that my fears were based on my performance. Part of me was trying to work hard to do everything right so that I could look this crisis in the face and know that I am on the right side of this. The same way that I knew what the outcome at work would be for me, at work I knew that if it came down to it, in the end, if the business was still standing, I would be there with it. What I never really realized until this time of reflection was that my spiritual was that in my spiritual life I felt like the people who had been warned that they were on the bubble, that their performance didn't guarantee anything. If they didn't shape up, they were going to be out on the street. Isaiah 64 6 says, But we are as unclean we are as an unclean thing. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. I've always feared the end because I can't stand firm on my own. At work, I wasn't super worried because my good work ethic and all my efforts put me in a safe place. I am versatile. I can do most of the jobs at the shop well, and I worked hard to be well thought of. As a result, for the most part, I was not worried about being without a job. But when it finally came down to it, to drop the axe and change things, my boss's grace has attempted to save everyone's job. Now I think I have a better defined understanding of how God's grace works. The works I do for him are really for me. They allow me to see what he is changing and has changed in me. My involvement in his plan is not to help him. It is to help me feel connected to him and give me his peace. Since I've gained this, gained this understanding, I already had a chance to test it out. An opportunity presented itself and right away I knew what I should do. In the past, I probably would have done the right thing because it was the right thing. This time, it felt so much more like a blessing. I literally couldn't wait to do it. I didn't think I've ever thanked God for an opportunity as genuinely as I did this time. Let me close with prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank you for what you've done in my life in the last week. I pray this reaches somebody who's in turmoil right now. And I thank you for helping them as well. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Hope everybody has a good night.